You couldn't ask for any more. A little bit more. Open uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. What a beautiful celebration in baptisms. And uh, the end of our message, we'll even talk about baptism and the spiritual ba baptism as the text lays out into that. Thank you. Beautiful voices and uh, instruments for just praising and uh, interacting with us over song and praise. And uh, Amen. We won't get started without you. Beautiful. Just wonderful to, to hear of the salvation of some people that said, I've had enough of me and I need Jesus. Remember that day? Amen. Amen. And to be baptized to say, okay, I'm going to stand up and, and let everybody know as a testimony of the Lord and what he's done for me. I would like to do what the Ethiopian eunuch said he'd like to do. What hinders me? What stops me? Believe. Believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and we'll baptize you. And so it was great to hear the testimonies and uh, it's a good preaching there, Brianna. That was good. Way to go. You said nice things about your husband. That's going to get you extra points. Praise the Lord. That's good. Amen. And of course, Kyler in speaking and having his own dad baptize him. It's good stuff. Good to be able to do that in the Terry. Praise the Lord to be able to see that. And uh, hallelujah. It was neat to hear Danny say that, uh, well, this is good. See, Josh isn't in here. I said, okay, but he now has one person that thinks he's the best pastor ever. <laughs> you can't go wrong with that. You need to build upon that now, Josh. You need to go with that. But that's tremendous. And Kristen, I know, Kristen showing, sharing me the story of how she came to know the Lord, fiance, Kyle, and hallelujah, they're both growing, and, and all of you. Dig into the Word of God, and let's uh, grow a little bit together, part of our message today. And even if you want to get a preview, verse number 1 of chapter 12, Paul immediately says, hey, I don't want you to be ignorant anymore. Ignorance is very simply a lack of knowledge. I don't want you to be in a place in your life where you don't know something that you could know. Paul spent a year and a half with his church at Corinth. He went down the street to Ephesus. He was there for a while came and wrote this letter as a response to them communicating with him that they need some help. We've got divisions. Uh, we have uh, perverted doctrine. Uh, we are really messed up. We, we, we follow not Jesus, but we follow multiple people. Uh, we have contentions. You can see that in chapter number 11. We covered that in, in uh, verse number uh, 16. Uh, if you seem to have contentions, there's contentious, uh, contentiousness. There's contentions message, message, uh, mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, chapter number 11, verse 18, right there next to chapter 12, it talks about divisions, and through it all, Paul says, I love you, and God's love never fails, and I'm going to walk you through all this stuff, I'm going to teach you the truth of God's word, I'm going to pour out some grace, and I'm going to be tough on you, I'm going to tell you the truth, I'm going to tell it to you in love, hey church, don't fall apart, and by the way, it is... Uh, second letter, you can still see that they had some struggles, that they were still struggling with some of the things that they were. But you could see maybe by the end of the second letter, they were getting there. Last week, we talked in chapter number 11 and finishing up some things on order. We talked in the first part of the chapter a couple weeks ago on order when it came to uh, the home, uh, women, men. Christ is the head, as it says in verse 2 of chapter number 11, that you understand, excuse me, verse number 3, I would have you to know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of the woman is the man, the head of Christ is God, and we approach that with what the scriptures say. Jesus Christ is God Almighty, speaking to God Almighty, never minimized who he is, but yet subjected himself and submitted himself to the Father's will. What a powerful picture of order. And of course, then we walked out the Lord's Supper last week and talked about the order that needed to be put down in there for the ordinance that was given to the church. And Paul said, look, I've given you ordinances and I want you to do them right. Well, today, as Randy spoke of it, uh, the ordinance of baptism in the local church, Paul gave these to the church. Of course, the Holy Spirit's teaching. You see, I'm just going to pull up a couple slides from last week that are appropriate for our introduction, 
You know what? Without order, there is chaos. Some form of that statement I'm sure you've heard. Without structure, everybody does whatever they want. Without order, there is chaos. What can be worse than the church that is out of order in regards to Jesus Christ as the head and the centerpiece of the Lord's Supper? There will be chaos. And that's where we ended up last week in our study in verse number 11. And I even highlighted a couple other verses in chapter 11, chapter number 1. There's divisions, there's contentious uh, contentions, there's just misteaching, failed teaching. See, when it centers up and we centered up on the Lord's Supper, we found that there was abuse in the early church and there's abuse in the Lord's Supper and other religions and we really need to get it back to where it ought to be. The original Passover celebrated Israel's temporary physical deliverance, it says up there, from the bondage of Pharaoh and Egypt, the Lord's Supper. It commemorates what Jesus has done, the death of God's own Son for the atonement of all sins, of all men for all time. You see, that was very important in the teaching here. I thank God for this church. It was founded right, and we continue to do what's right by the Word of God and by the Holy Spirit of God, by what the body of Christ is to do. And when there is a place of abuse of the Lord's Supper or an ordinance, hey, we'll just baptize people anytime, anywhere, anyhow. No, no, don't abuse the ordinance of the Lord's Supper or baptism. So now, as we spoke last week, Paul spoke to God's glory in order, that the order of everything as it points to the ordinance of the Lord's Supper We remember Jesus Christ, and we spent time here. We, of course, had the Lord's Supper maybe once once every couple months. As often as we do it, we remember what Jesus Christ did for us. For that being an introduction and thinking about it, you see the last verse of chapter 34. I've got part of it up there on the screen. And the rest will I set in order when I come. Paul says, hey... I want to come back. It says in Acts 20, it doesn't break it out clearly. He had a little bit of a tour of Macedonia. It says he spent three months in Greece. Did he pop in in Corinth? Did he pop in in Thessalonica? Did he pop in in some of the other places in his last missionary journey? It's hard to say for sure, but we say that to say this, that Paul cared about this church. He cared about things being done right, and he did it out of a Love never fails the thinking process. As we enter into chapter number 12, 12, 13, and 14 now, and I'm going to teach them through. we got a little bit short in time with baptism, but that's cool. Just follow along with me when it talks to the spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts is one of the most controversial things that can come up in the New Testament church. Because very simply put, as in the ordinances of the Lord's Supper and baptism, When it comes to how you get saved, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit of God, how you and I would be divisive over who we follow, the authority of the church. When it comes to spiritual gifts, there's a lot of different teaching. There's a lot of teaching that would point itself to more of the glory of man and less of the glory of God. They would minimize Holy Spirit who's giving the gift and maximize the gift partaker or the gift owner. You see, there's no gift that you've been given by the Holy Spirit of God, a spiritual gift that's for your own glory. It's for him. And we know in chapter number 12 and chapter number 14 that Paul deals with a lot of the spiritual gift stuff. In between there is this often quickly mentioned, out of context, chapter number 13, which is an incredible chapter on the charity the love of the Lord, the love that never fails, and, and, and everything about that, you say, well, what? did God make a mistake by setting chapter number 13 in between those two chapters? I mean, he broke it all up. No, he didn't. The last verse of chapter number 12, look at it real quick just in your Bibles, but covet earnestly the best gifts. Paul's saying after teaching on gifts, and before I'm going to teach a little bit more on it in chapter 14, Just understand in verse number 31 of chapter number 12, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. What's the more excellent way? It starts in chapter number 13, verse number 1. Charity. Charity. Paul wrote in the letter to the Colossians, charity is the bond of perfectness. That means that it's 
the thing that completes us. It's the completion package of really having this life in Jesus Christ. Without that charity peace, then these spiritual gifts will be misunderstood. They will be perverted. They will be twisted. They will be misused. They will give honor and glory to man. And when we think about what God has done in his word, of course, it's perfectly ordered. It goes back to that statement of order. Then we know, as it says in verse number 12 of chapter number 12, which we'll finish up our message on, as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. This is a unifier. Charity is the unifier. These three chapters in cohesion show us how God wants to deliver the message on everything in his word, that I am in the midst of it. My son, the Lord Jesus Christ, is in the midst of the word of God. He is the living word of God. And as ministers of Christ, we're going to be head account of it, accountable to it if truly we are born again. I think again of the controversial subject of the Holy Spirit gifts. Let me just put a couple things up there, and then we'll get into the reading of chapter number 12, first 13 verses. A spiritual gift is a God-given ability by which the Holy Spirit of God supernaturally ministers to the body of Christ. It is something that the Spirit of God does through us as we make ourselves available for his use. Points back to something I mentioned just a minute ago, the Holy Spirit gives you a spirit gift as a born-again believer that's not for you. It's for the church. It's for the edification of others. It's for the glory of God. It is truly and completely of the Holy Spirit, and it shows his oneness in us in Christ, and he would like to have us grasp the depth of having this gift from him, not so that we can once again, hold it selfishly, but rather to be part of the unity of the church, to have this discussion and learning and teaching scenario where we know that there is diversity, that we can understand that there is maturity gained here in knowing what the spiritual gift of God is to each one of us and the package of the spiritual gifts that come from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a person. He is God. He is part of the Trinity. But he also, beyond the personage of him, has a ministry, the Holy Spirit's office that he holds. And you must know and I must know that in that ministry, in that carrying out of the office, that a big part of it is the spiritual gifts that you receive that interact and work in the body of Christ. Ephesians 4, just highlighting a couple of companion passages that work truly in the word here. There is one body, there is one spirit, and even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. The one baptism is the baptism that happens to you when you get saved. The baptizer, Jesus, you are buried in his death and you're made alive and the Holy Spirit comes inside of you. That's the baptism, the one baptism. But your Bible has many others. If you looked at 1 Corinthians chapter number 10, you would be reminded that we taught on the baptism of the nation of Israel. Baptized by Moses. It says there, look at there real quick in, in 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. And we're all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and the sea. That reminds us again that there are other baptisms, other immersions. The word means to immerse. But clearly, by the passage of scripture here, in that unity of the spirit and the bond of peace that Paul is teaching the church at Ephesus, which was a model church that left their first love. What a great church, by the way. He's saying there is a oneness and a unity and a beauty, and the spirit of God does this through us if we would allow him to. You see, intentional unity in the body of Christ welcomes the diversity of gifts in unity, and then grab the diversity 
we handle this mature wise. I love ministering with you here. I have the honor and privilege of ministering alongside of all of you and serving with you. And many of you grasp this. You understand the truth of this. That intentional unity in the body of Christ welcomes the diversity of all gifts from the Holy Spirit. Magnifies the name of Jesus Christ. How many gifts are there? We'll break it down as much as we can. But the gifts are mentioned here in 1 Corinthians 12 and 14. They're mentioned in Romans, they're mentioned in Peter, they're mentioned in different places, Ephesians, there are spiritual gifts. The, the list, I can't say 100% sure that I know exactly how many there are. Some may say, well, I know exactly, well, <laughs> you keep on looking and you go, wait a minute, God gave someone a spirit gift. By the Holy Spirit, he gave somebody a spiritual gift off of the gift of the administrations, which is shown here in chapter number 12. And so there must be many in that that you and I just maybe don't pay attention to till we realize it's the Holy Spirit at work. Remember, again, what it says in Romans chapter number 6. You don't have to turn there, but I'll read it really fast in terms of what happens to us and the Spirit of God. It says in Romans 6, 3, Know ye not that so many of you as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. When you got saved, when you called on the name of the Lord to save you, you were immersed in him. You're dead in Christ, and then you were raised, and that's why we do it that way. Where do you think the verb, verbiage comes? Verse number four. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the, father of, the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. Buried in the likeness of Christ's death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection. That's where you get it from, the Bible. You thought we just made that up. You think Bobby and I would sit in the back corner and Dwayne, hey, what are we going to say up there? We borrowed it from all the guys before us. But it's accurate because it's biblical in the idea of the picture of what happens in the water baptism. Again, this intentional unity is so important because the Holy Spirit gives us gifts. Gifts for the body. Thus the title of our, of our study today for a few minutes. Gifts for the body. You start thinking about gifts, all of you are going, mm. oh gosh, gifts for the body. Uh, what's for lunch today? What's my gift for my body? That's what you're thinking right now. Mm. We're not talking about, well... In the body in the church, look at all the wonderful gifts. We have children's ministry. What a great gift. We have uh, youth ministry, and we have these beautiful walls and the paint. Look at all the gifts. And so we're thankful for them. But here's the spiritual side of things. A spiritual gift is something that God gives you on his decision by the Holy Spirit of God to give it to you. And again, it's not for you. You say you might get a spiritual gift. You don't even know how to use it. You don't know how it is. You just, it just came upon you. Thank you, God. Does God just, you go into a little booth and you check off some boxes and say, okay, God, today I would like the spiritual gift of running the church. A few people have sent me an email of that, so I understand. If you don't know how the spirit gift that God, <laughs> did you say amen? You're bad. <laughs> Take that off the television. Here, listen. You get a spirit gift from God, and you don't know how to use it. You ought to check the instruction manual. Somebody gives you a gift at home from, for Christmas, you go, what is this? For some of you, it might be like tools on how to handle your finances at home, and you go, what do I do with this? You better read the instruction manual. Start saving more than spending. When we get spiritual gifts from the Father, we say, okay, the Holy Spirit give me a spiritual gift. Thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus. I know I'm born again and I got this. What do I do with it? Check in the Word of God and he'll tell you what to do with it. And learn from someone. There should not be a place where we have such deep ignorance over matters, a lack of knowledge. That's part of this text that's going to come at us. So here I'm going to do, read the text. We already spent some time in prayer, so we're going to read the text, and I'm going to give you four quick ones, just really lesson points, and they're going to fit because they really come from 13 verses, and usually I take two and a half hours, but this should be maybe only an hour and a half, so here we go, let's go. Our men's study was nice and long yesterday, it was good. 
Now concerning spiritual gifts, verse 1, chapter number 12, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Lack of knowledge. I, I would not have you to be ignorant, brothers and sisters in the Lord. Ye know that ye were Gentiles carried away unto these dumb idols, even as ye were led. Dumb idols. You can find that in Habakkuk. You can find that in Isaiah. The prophets talked about the idolatry that infiltrated the nation of Israel that they were exposed to, and they became ignorant. Well, these Gentiles in the New Testament at this time right there are still carrying it on. Generation after generation after generation going after by the demons and devils and satanic ways of offering sacrifices to the wicked one. And he's saying, I would not have you to live in a place of ignorance over the Holy Spirit's gifts as you lived in a place of ignorance over the dumb idol idolatry sacrifices that you did. Understand the context as he's teaching these people. You get saved, you're born again. You need to not stop being unlearned over things. You need to stop just saying, oh, I'm going to do whatever I'm told without asking. You need to find out the truth of what's going on here. And that's what Paul's telling you. Well, I'm just going to go along with the way that the devil's directing things. Absolutely not. Well, I'll just do what the church tells me to do from the pastor and what he very says. Check your Bible out. Because he doesn't want you to be ignorant. Lack of knowledge. He wants you to know what the Holy Spirit has for you in the spiritual gifts. I don't want you to be ignorant in this matter. And he compares it to a matter in which they were ignorant in their past. In following after idolatry. Verse number three. Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Spirit. Once you're born again, Holy Spirit comes in, dead in Christ, raised up. Now, how in the world could anyone who's truly born again ever accursed Jesus' name? That's what he's saying. You're born again. There's no, well, I'm so schizophrenic. I don't know if I'm saved or lost. You're either saved or you're lost. And when you're saved... You acknowledge the name of Jesus. You give Jesus the name, uh, the glory of his name. You speak of him because the Holy Spirit is giving witness of his name. Go to John chapter number 14, 15, 16. You'll see how Jesus taught how the comforter is going to come. And he's going to magnify the name of Jesus Christ. Someone who's born again could not accurse Jesus unless there's something really wrong. Again, this is just the first three verses of the intro. Now I'm going to read the rest of our passage, 4 through 13, and then we're just going to break it down real quickly. I wanted to give you that as a background of what Paul's saying in chapter number 12. He broke away from 8, 9, 10, 11. Now this is new stuff. Verse number, uh, chapter number 12, 13, and 14, as I said earlier, they're dealing with spiritual gifts in a more excellent way, which is charity. Okay, verse number 4, four down through 13, follow along. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit withal. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. To another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit. To another, the gifts of healing by the same Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, divers kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one and self same Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. That means the Holy Spirit knows what each church needs and gives it to them accordingly. Verse 12 and 13. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body. I read this earlier. So also is Christ. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. Okay? So there you go. These are the gifts for the body. Gifts, boy, again, we love those gifts. Now, how do we use them? Well, I need to learn. I need someone to teach me. And then God 
I truly want more learning. I want to grab it in the right way. I don't want to be ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. I don't want to have myself be in a place where knowledge puff up when I know that charity edifieth. I want to know about these spiritual gifts. They're like fingerprints. They're like fingerprints. Each one. And each person has a unique, special character to it. I don't know if you and I would say that the answers are easy and quick. I don't see them. I see them as, hey, it's going to take some time to know who, what, where, how, why. How do they all fit? Why did he get this? Why did she get that? Sometimes they all just say, like some authors and some teachers will say, well, there's the speaking gifts, and there's the special gifts, and there's the sign gifts, and there's the serving gifts, and so we got them all categorized. Let's just close up the Bible and go away. Well, there's a lot here. And I'm going to break down more of it in a couple of Sundays when I come back to chapter number 12. But we're just going to make some simple points here. Next Sunday, Pastor Roe Porter will be preaching for us. He will be in town for the men's conference. Quick three-second commercial. Men sign up for the men's conference. You have many opportunities. There's emails and buttons flying everywhere. Wives, tell your husbands, sign up. That, will that work? Thank you, girls. Thank you, girls. You're awesome. Four simple things. With time, let me use it wisely. Your time is valuable. The first one, Holy Spirit gifts pave the way. That's the tag I'll use for deeper understanding while reducing ignorance in the body of Christ. I'm honored again and privileged to pastor a church where all of you, have a measure and depth of knowledge and growth and you know the word of God to a point. And you're here Sunday because you want to learn more and you want to grow. There are opportunities all week long, all month long to learn and to grow. Ignorance, again, is a place where we would simply define it as a lack of knowledge, a lack of knowing some things. Paul's telling this church, hey, for deeper understanding, verse number three, Wherefore I give to you, give you to understand, we, by the Holy Spirit, he paves the way for deeper understanding while reducing the ignorance in the body of Christ. You can carefully, quietly, privately get a hold of any of the pastors, any of their wives, anybody in ministry leadership and say, hey, I don't know that much, but I love to learn. Could somebody teach me the Bible? Could somebody walk me through one by one discipleship? Or I'd like to go to a Sunday group or stuff. Well, let me just put it up on the screen. There is extensive effort at First Bible Baptist Church to minimize ignorance in the believers. There's a, the, the, we go as much as we can. We don't have a menu at 54th Street where you can get the au jus suit, you know, and the thing. And, you know, and uh, I better not do that. It's lunchtime. I don't know, the gringo dip's pretty good, though. But this is not a menu as much as it's just a reference place. We want to minimize. We know that people are not going to have the ability to be at certain things at different times. But I can tell you, one by one, Sunday groups, discipleship and ministry hour, both in the cafe, 9 and 1030, A1ABI, the Bible Institute, we're in our, whatever, 50, whatever, Small groups, kindred, daughters of the king, prayer groups, Bible studies. If you want to learn and we want to grow, you want to, amen. Many of you have taken advantage of that. Many of you are ingrained. Many of you are in. You've learned as much as you want to learn. Hallelujah. But please understand in the text of this scripture that we don't want to be in a place where we don't know something because it wasn't put before us as an opportunity to grow and to know. Ephesians 4, going back to that wonderful chapter, verses number 17 through 20. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind. He's talking to a church that loves Jesus. A church that's born again, following after the Lord, Holy Spirit, gifts, everything. He's talking to them, but he's saying, hey... Therefore, brethren, watch out. I don't want you to walk like the Gentiles walk, which means you're saved, but you're not walking like the Spirit's leading you. 
You're not in the scriptures. You're not studying the word of God. You're not going after things. In fact, you're walking with the vanity of your mind. Having the understanding darkened. Being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. He's referencing the Gentiles and saying, hey, believers in Ephesus, I don't want you to live that way. Verse number 19 says this. Who, being past feeling, have given themselves over into lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. He's saying that's the way the Gentiles were. I sure hope you're not living that way because it would come back to this place of verse number 20, but ye have not so learned Christ. That's what it would look like. When you say I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me. Then I understand he gave himself for me. Then this new nature takes over and I don't need to be in that place where, ha, I'm back to that Gentile way of living. I didn't mean to, but I fell into that place again. The Holy Spirit of God paves the way for us to have a deeper understanding while reducing ignorance in the body of Christ. The second thing that I have for you in a lesson point, Holy Spirit gives paves the, pave the way for diversities in the body while oneness remains in the same work, good, excuse me, the same God at work. Where do you get that from? Look at verse number four. Now there are diversities of the gifts but the same Spirit. There are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but is the same God which worketh in all in all. For diversities, hey, the Holy Spirit pays the way. I'm going to give diversity of gifts in the body, but I also want the oneness to continue and remain in the same God that's at work. You think about right there administrations. It might be somebody that says, I've got the gift of administration, a spirit gift, and they've proven it so someone actually says they have it in their lives. But they may have an ability to say, I can interact with people, listen to what they want, listen to what they need, listen to their ministry things, and I can carry it out for them. I can pass it on to the person that has the gift of operations, where that person of operations can walk through it, come up with a way of doing it in the Spirit, in the Lord, and then they can work together. There's different parts. It says there's diversities. Can you imagine the different things of the diversities of operations, the diversities of administrations? And all I'm saying and making that point is the Holy Spirit when he gives gifts, he paves the way for the diversities. Not the diversities in your culture or your skin color or your race or the way that you personally are and your personality, but rather in the diversity of the Holy Spirit gift. We're not in a place here where we ought to not understand, but rather understand the spiritual gifts. It says up on the screen, spiritual gifts are given to believers to express and strengthen the unity they have in Christ. I said this earlier in a different way. Grasp what this says. These are special capacities. They're bestowed upon believers to equip them to minister supernaturally to others, especially each other. Something happens out of someone. They have a, a word of wisdom, a gift of wisdom. They are able to say something in a setting, and you're going, that must be a spiritual gift because that guy's not that smart. <laughs> But you think about that. That's a Holy Spirit thing. That's a supernatural gift that comes from him, the Holy Spirit of God. And he's saying, I've got diversities for you in the body, but the oneness remains. 2 Corinthians chapter number 10, verse number 12 is up on the screen. There's a lot there. I'm just going to read verse number 12. For we dare not, Paul says, to the same church later on in another letter... Not make ourselves of the number, or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. Paul's saying, hey, in fact, verse 13 says, I said I wouldn't read anymore. Let me read verse 13 for context. But we will not boast of things without our measure. But according to the measure of the rule which God hath distributed to us, a measure to reach even unto you. It's all for the gospel, he says, in the next couple of verses. 
We're not boasting of things without measure. That is, of other men's labors. How about a testimony and a witness of what God has done? A testimony and witness of the glory of God, the Holy Spirit of God in his gifting to us. Because again, when it comes down to it, the Holy Spirit of God is paving the way for diversities of gifts. Oh, you know what? You don't have the teaching gift. You're not as wonderful as me. I can't even imagine that God could use you in this church. We ought to be careful. Number three, Holy Spirit gifts pave the way for manifestation of the same Spirit while recognizing His power. An overview of verses 7 through 11. Catch this, verse 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit withal. Those are the people that are born again in the Holy Spirit. The Word of God is telling us. For to one is given by the Spirit the Word of wisdom, another the Word of knowledge by the same Spirit. And on and on it goes. The phrase here, same Spirit. Do you see that? Verse number 8. By the Spirit, the word of wisdom. By another, the word of knowledge, same Spirit. Verse number 9, to another, the gifts of healing by that same Spirit. Verse number 10, we are speaking about the self-same Spirit in verse number 11. All these worketh that one, the self-same Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. The manifestation of the Spirit, what does it mean to manifest? To make things completely clear. To point to the glory of God and say, this is visible now where before it wasn't visible. It's not hidden. The Holy Spirit makes it visible to you that someone has a spiritual gift. Not by their resume, but rather by the Word of God. Rather by the Spirit of God. Spiritual gifts are essential to the building of the body of Christ. And the Holy Spirit of God is the supernatural source. The gifts properly used will build strengthen and unite the church which one do i have is there a test that i can take is there something that you can walk me through i will just give you a simple hint that was given to me years ago while i when i first when i early got saved and you know the guy that said it he said look if you want to find out how the holy spirit is going to gift you and how that you could maybe use a physical talent that you have to work on to serve others. That you need to sign up once in a while. You need to say, yes, I'm willing to do something. I'm willing more than anything to learn, too. So I want to learn. I want to go ahead and do it. But I don't want to be in a place where all I'm doing is doing. Right, Michael? I don't want to be a place where all I do is do. I want to be in a place where I learn what it means to be in the Lord. So then when the Holy Spirit gives me that which he gives me as a spiritual gift, I'll know what to do with it the right way. And not walk around and say I'm better because I have something that someone else doesn't have. So something has to happen in my life to set myself over to the Lord so he can conform me to the image of Christ. These spiritual gifts are what? To strengthen, build, and unite the church, but they must be properly used and not abuse the spiritual gifts. The same as we don't abuse the Lord's Supper. We can abuse anything that's of God because we love to take credit for God's stuff. We love to do that. We don't even know we're doing it when we do it. We need to do it the right way by learning how to be what he would have us to be and let him then drop in us the gift that he would have for us, or two or three. Romans 12, verses number four and five, a passage of scripture that talks a lot about gifts. For as we have many members in one body and all members have not the same office, we don't. All of you have different stuff, but again, I'm so thankful for the diversity of the gifts here. You might be sitting on a gift instead of allowing God to do something through you and give you a gift you say well i guess i just maybe need to just get involved a tiny just a tiny bit just a tiny bit i'm not asking you to run the children's ministry i'm just asking you to pray through and consider moving forward in the word and the spirit of god and the church that you're in and saying i need to learn and grow i'm willing so we being many verse number five are one body in christ and every one members one of another, kind of sounds like verse number 12 here, which is what we're going to finish up with. The fourth thing, and I am done. 
Holy Spirit of God gifts paved the way for the distinction in our spirit baptism while embracing divine unity. I spoke of it a little bit earlier when we were talking about our baptism time there. Holy Spirit gifts paved the way for the distinction in our spirit baptism while embracing this divine unity. It is divine because it's of God. It's heavenly. It's holy. It's of Him. It has divinity written all over it. You and I ought not to be who we are in Christ, but He, by His grace, gave us what we have so that we can be what He would have us to be in Him. He gives us that. He says, here by my grace, here by my grace, your salvation is by my grace. Your redemption is by my grace. The propitiation, the payment, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the glory that you will have one day in heaven, nothing to compare to the sufferings that you have here. That's my gift by grace. The spiritual gifts that you have, they're by my grace. But remember what happened to you when you got saved. The spirit baptism happened to you. And you need to embrace this unity we have one another. If you're lost today and you do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior, then you probably have a sense of being not unified with the body. Well, that's true. I would love to have you know what it means to be saved. How that, that young boy was reading off of a note card of how he wanted to know what it meant to be saved. He's growing up in a home with his mom and dad, but his note card, you could hear him, is saying, hey, I just, I asked my mom and I asked my dad, and I know that I'm a sinner. It was beautiful. Just as much as it was when Brianna was talking about what happened to her, just as much as it was when Kristen, just as much when it was talking about Danny. What's my point? That spirit baptism that happens to you when you're born again changes everything. And when you are dead in Christ and made alive in his resurrection and the spirit of God comes in, that's where the baptizer Jesus puts the spirit of God in a way in which you cannot run away. There's spiritual circumcision that happens to you. Christ baptized us into the spirit of God, the act which places us in the body. This one common life principle draws all of this together. It puts it all together. It provides energy, purpose, destiny to the organism. We are a living organism. Yes, we have partly an organization, but we are a living organism. When we stop being a living organism, led by the head of the body, Jesus Christ, we are in trouble. We must be alive in Christ. We must be alive by his word. We are a living organism, and he empowers it. Jesus Christ baptized us into the spirit of God, the act by which we are placed into the body of Christ. You say, well, I need to know what gift I have. I need to know if I can speak in tongues. I need to know about the interpretation of all that. I need to know all these things and how you're going to break them all down. Come back in two Sundays and I'll talk to you a little bit about it. Galatians chapter number 3, and I pull it all together with this verse. For ye are all, excuse me, for ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many as you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And this is the record that God has given eternal life, and that life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son hath not life. Whew. As many as received unto them gave me power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. In Christ alone. You are born again, and in Christ alone, the Holy Spirit of God gives you the gifting that he wants to give you. Let's lessen our lack of knowledge and gain it in the proper way. Let us be willing to learn. It says up on the screen for our prayer time, what's my gifting? What's my ministry? That might be a question to ask God. You might say, God, how do I fit And then, how do we all fit in the body of Christ? 
Maybe your prayer today is, Lord, I am willing to learn. I am willing to find out. I am willing to track down something, somebody, somewhere. I'm willing to go to the men's conference on Friday and Saturday. It's less than 24 hours of a commitment. To maybe have some fellowship in the Spirit of God. Maybe a song captures your heart about wanting to do that which God calls you. Maybe the preaching of His Word just finally wakes up and says, I got it, God. I'm willing to learn more. Would you please bow your head for a word of prayer as we come to our prayer time and our invitation? Our Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for how you love us. We sung about that today. Oh, what powerful words and song, but even more so, what powerful words in your word today in the name of Jesus by your Holy Spirit. We are one, and we've been baptized into Jesus Christ and raised in his resurrection. We're alive. We've been quickened at the moment that we got saved. I pray for those that do not know Jesus Christ as Savior. I pray you would put upon their heart maybe to make a move and ask a question today, maybe this week, I don't know. Only you know by your spirit. And I pray for the believers today, the followers of Jesus, the members of First Bible, the body of Christ. I pray for everyone that's under the sound of your reading and teaching and preaching today that you grab a hold of their hearts, that this will be a time of prayer and commune with you, for truly we know it's all about you, Jesus. Thank you, in Jesus' name. Please stand.